This is Update One, the podcast of the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Update One provides a forum for listeners to learn about national and international stories, focusing on journalism and communication issues, news, and politics. Now, the latest edition of Update One. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Update One. This is your host, Shannon Fisher. We have a very special guest today. John King is CNN's chief national correspondent and the host of Inside Politics. He spent his career covering elections from just about every angle. And today we're going to talk to him about the differences in the way journalists cover candidates in primaries versus general elections. John, welcome. Thanks for having me. You have covered elections more than perhaps anybody in the business. So do you find that there are any universal differences between the coverage that you guys do of primaries and the general elections? Well, especially when you have a cr- crowded primary, um, it's not here. Uh, you, have, you need more resources. Uh, you have more candidates. It's a challenge to be fair to everybody in the sense that you're trying to be objective in how you cover the candidates. But when you're producing a newscast, a podcast, uh, writing an article, whatever it is you do, you have to make subjective decisions, even as you try to be objective. Who's the mm-hmm. lead story today? Who gets the front page? Uh, who gets two minutes as opposed to who gets 30 seconds? So those the challenge in a crowded primary like we have on the Democratic side now um, It's frustrating every day, and you have to come to school every day and come back to work every day and ask yourself, was I fair yesterday? Um, Did I miss something? You're never going to get to it all in one day, so try to think outside the box and find, you know, backdoor ways to get at stories that might not be the top story or the front page story, uh, but are still interesting stories. Cover the news, cover the issues, and sometimes try to find a way to get to the, the personalities, both in the candidates and the people behind the campaign. So there's a lot to do in a crowded primary. It, it gets, quote unquote, a little easier in a general election. When you have two candidates or in today's world, maybe third party candidates to think about as well, who might not come anywhere close to winning, but can swing the election. Uh, But one one step at a time would be my advice, I guess. Get through the primary season first, then take a deep breath and figure out the general election. Journalists are so crazed right now trying to cover everything that there's there's no rest for the weary. So you've been uh, an embedded reporter in campaigns. You've been an anchor, an analyst, and you've played just about every possible role a political journalist can play. So what factors do you find that you use to approach covering from these different angles and these different roles? Um, the lesson I learned in my first campaign, my first presidential campaign was 1988. I was 23, just 24 years old during that campaign. I traveled mostly with Governor Dukakis, but during the primary season, I spent a little bit of time in Iowa going back and forth between the Democratic and the Republican campaigns. First time I met Bob Dole was in 1987 in Iowa, for example. Uh, The most important lesson to me was I was introduced to America then. I was based in Boston. I hadn't traveled very much. My family didn't have much money when we were growing up, so I hadn't traveled much. And you're literally getting introduced to America as you go through the campaign calendar. You're in Iowa, then you're in New Hampshire, then you're moving on to the Midwest, and you go to the South, and you go places you've never been, and you realize the 50 different pieces of the puzzle are pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. They're different. The voters are different. The economies are different. What's under the ground is different. Uh, So people's culture and economies and understanding, and therefore their politics are different. So always remember that. I work indoors now mostly at an anchor desk, and the one thing I remind myself of every single day If you're inside, you don't understand what's happening outside, so don't pretend you do. Trust the reporters in the field. They're the ones who are seeing it every day. Absolutely. I, had, I hadn't thought about the, uh, the fact that you, just like the candidates, are seeing the different shades of America and county by county. Well, speaking of county by county, you're the man with the numbers when it comes to elections. So how do polling methods and communication strategies differ between the Democrats and the Republicans, both in the primaries and in the general? Well, part of it is the technology of campaigns has changed so much since I started. So that's and that applies to Democrats, Republicans, independents, whatever, just the technology in terms of just like we can communicate with people around the world instantaneously, they can communicate with voters instantaneously. Uh, The Trump campaign right now is a great example of this. Uh, more of a ragtag shoestring operation in 2016. It is an incredibly well-financed, incredibly well-staffed, whether you support the president or don't support the president's re-election, um, you should be watching and studying his campaign operation because they use these rallies to get data, phone numbers, email mm-hmm. address, contact, and then they keep in touch with you. And so today they might text you an ad on immigration. Tomorrow they'll text you an ad on the economy. The next day it'll be something else. And they watch your reaction 
Did you respond? Did you post something about it if it was on Facebook or Instagram? Uh, did you send money if it was a fundraising appeal? Did you ignore three in a row? And they can use that to find out what triggers you, what animates mm -hmm. you, what motivates you, what turns you away. And if they can do that now in February, March, and April, imagine that what they know about you by the time October and November comes around, they're trying to motivate either for you to vote for the president or to not vote for somebody else. So there's polling in campaigns, but to me, the big data and the instantaneous contact is the biggest change in the technology of campaigns. And as reporters, we need to be plugged into this as well. Uh, we should be anyway, but we should especially be after the Russian interference and all the other lessons of 2016 as we watch it go forward. It is an enormously great gift, too, as a reporter and someone who's now more often in Washington. I would love to be traveling the country more. Uh, but you can keep in touch with voters and with you know political activists and with campaign people and county Democratic chairmen and um, labor union leaders in, at the county level or even at the local level. You can keep in touch with them because of the technology to now be a better reporter, uh, project yourself into America, even if you can't be out in America, in a way you could never do before. It's, it's kind of like we're in a nonstop campaign because no matter uh, whether it's a, a general election year for the president or whether it's local races, um, it sounds like the campaigns are, are constantly reaching out to journalists and there's a lot to learn. So when one party has an incumbent president, like we have Trump right now running for re-election, the focus on the primaries is largely directed toward the other party's candidate. And your audience has a wide range of political ideologies. How do you make the information you report interesting across the political spectrum? Um, part of it is, and the business gets criticized for this, but it is a horse race, right? Who's on first? Who's winning? Uh, that is part of it. And you can never set that aside, especially in the competitive race where we have seen just recently in the Democratic race, things change. If you rewind the tape a few months, Joe Biden is the front runner. Joe Biden's leading in all the national polls. Joe Biden's at least competitive in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, Joe Biden, when Democrats are asked who's best to beat Donald Trump, that's Joe Biden's lane. Well, that's changed, right? And so that's part of the story. Bernie Sanders has momentum. Bernie Sanders is doing much better in the polling. Democrats increasingly think Bernie Sanders is as strong as Joe Biden or any other candidate when it comes to Donald Trump. So that's part of it. And, and we need to cover that. We, you know, it is, a, it is a race. It's a competition. It's a sport, if you will. Right. And therefore, you, you have to say who's winning. That's, you know, you can't pick up a sports page and say, you know, the Celtics played the Lakers and not mention the score. <laughs> you know, <laughs> your, consum your consumers would kill you. Uh, so we get criticized sometimes for focusing too much on the horse race, and that's fair. But we do need to cover the horse race. Then I think the biggest challenge is both parties, both parties. President Trump did this in 2016, where he took over the Republican Party. It was a hostile takeover. There's no, no other way to describe it. He was not welcome. He came in and the establishment quickly realized how out of touch they were with their own voters who supported Trump. So now we're going through it on the Democratic side. Are the Democrats ready to do something they've never done before? Go so far to the left that they nominate somebody who says Medicare for all free college tuition, a very expensive Green New Deal, and a whole host of other things that were, are to the left of Walter Mondale, who lost 49 states, to the left of Michael Dukakis, who lost 40 states. So that's why you have this panic, right? This panic among quote unquote establishment Democrats. Bernie yeah. Sanders will lose in a landslide. We don't know that he will. Maybe mm -hmm. he'll win. He's just as competitive as Joe Biden. If you look at the national polls, it's just the things that have never been done before scare people. Or the things when, they, when anything close to it has been done before and it hasn't worked, scare people. But what I always try to tell, especially the young people around my show and, and covering politics now is, you know, 10 years ago, we could never elect a black president. Four years ago, there's no way Trump could win the Republican nomination. There's absolutely no way Trump can beat Hillary Clinton. Bernie Sanders against Hillary Clinton? Come on, that's a joke. Um, he didn't win Bernie Sanders, but he put a lot of dents in the aircraft carrier Hillary Clinton yeah. four years ago. So we live in very volatile times where I've done this for 35 years. You like to think that all those things you learned, all that experience is helpful to you. Not as much as you would hope. There's, we're, we're in the middle of everything is changing so fast. The economy, technology, medicine, and politics. And so sometimes the old rules don't apply anymore and we have to keep an open mind. So as we cover the horse race, I think we should cover the issues debate, the ideological debate, the philosophical debate in both parties, but largely you're right. Right now it's confined mostly to the Democrats in public. The Republican debate is much more private. Sure, sure. And with with all of the focus on all of the campaigns and the horse race and uh, the, the frenetic pace of everything that is happening, how do you balance the amount of coverage you give to anything outside of 
primaries or a general election? What are the more universal political topics and how do you how do you work them in amid all the chaos? That is such a great question. And it's a test I fail every day, but it's a test I hope to get better at every day in the sense that why are these things happening? That's the bigger story. Trump was not Trump is not the source of America's discontent. Trump was not the source of the changes in the Republican Party. He rode the wave. He tapped into it. He grabbed it, smartly seized it. Again, if you don't like the president, you don't probably don't like the word smartly. He did a very smart thing in 2016. He took over a party that didn't want him, and then he won the White House against the, all the odds. Why? Mm -hmm. By connecting with people who feel completely disconnected from politics. It's part of the Bernie Sanders success as well. He fights the establishment. People have lost faith in big institutions, including government, including the big banks, including the news media to a degree. And so these candidates who are finding a way to connect with voters who have given up, they don't think politicians speak their language. They don't think politicians or sometimes journalists talk in a way that is relevant to their life. And so for me, the challenge always is we're going to cover the Medicare issue. We're going to cover you know, the financial issues. We're going to cover any issue. Okay. Here's how we talk about it in Washington. Is that how they talk about it in America? Because Washington's not America. And so I think we can learn from successful candidates, whether they're running for president or whether they're running for governor or whether they're running for county council, when surprise candidates, unorthodox candidates, outside the box candidates come along and succeed, uh, we should not only study who they are, but how they're doing it and the language they speak. And sometimes you learn, you know, I was talking a lot about that issue too. Why wasn't I not connecting? Uh, sometimes we speak Washington, not American. And so that's what, what, I, what I try to study when I watch candidates and read about candidates is how, not just what are they communicating about, but how do they do it? That is excellent advice for all journalists who are looking for, for ways to, to cover this from a more, a more human angle that does connect with Americans. Well, John King, I know your schedule is incredibly hectic, so I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us today for Update One. It's been a complete pleasure. Thank you very much. Absolutely. This was a treat. And for Update One, this is Shannon Fisher. See you next time. Update One is a production of the National Press Club's Broadcast Podcast Committee. You can comment on this podcast or any episode of Update One by sending an email to Update One Podcast. That's update the number one podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to Update One.